Can I confess something to you? Something like 80% of you are already subscribed to this channel, so I feel like this is a community where I can be open about who I am and how I feel. So I want to tell you something that I just don't feel comfortable admitting to random people in the profession, and that is, I do not feel like I'm a great economist most of the time. A lot of times I feel really insecure about my abilities to be an economist and to do economics. But this year, there have been a lot of things that have helped me become a better economist, especially some books that I've read this year. And I wanted to share those with you because I know a lot of you are aspiring economists who are interested in improving your skills and improving your ability to look at the world and see the power of markets and economics in shape it. And that's what we're about here at Market Power. So I want to help you become a better economist. So let me share with you the four books that made me a better economist this year. I'm going to get the first book just out of the way because it gives me anxiety when I come across this book. It's like, think about Tony Stark in the restaurant in Iron Man 3. Tell me. How did you get out of the wormhole? Wait a minute. That's how I feel when I read sections of this book. So I'm just going to get this out of the way, so that way we can get on to the other books in this series. I actually have that first book right here. The book is The Art of Doing Science and Engineering, Learning to Learn by Richard Hamming. Richard Hamming was a big, big academic in the field of information theory. He was in more of the engineering side, but he worked with a lot of economists. Although the contents of this book are pretty old, it's a brand new edition of this. It's just published this year by Stripe Press, and it is fantastic. Even though it's about engineering, there's so much more to it than just engineering. The last chapter is called You and Your Research, and this is the part that gives me anxiety. When I go through here and read this, it's just this call to be focused on things that are more important. And you can see right here, this is the third paragraph in that chapter. As far as I know, each of you has but one life to lead. And it seems to me it is better to do significant things than to just get through life to its end. This is the kind of book that I just pick it up every once in a while and I just go through it to try and find inspiration, to find that setting my sights a little bit higher. It's so good in that it's, really pointing people towards working on important work, which I get questions on myself all the time. Like, am I working on some of the most important things that I can do? Like working on this channel, I feel like is really important by reaching out to this community and building economists, making sure that we're making better economic thinkers in the world. So I feel like I am working on important things, but there are many times where I wonder, is this really important? Do people really want this or need this? And so a lot of times I'll read this and that sentence just comes up and it just is on my mind. And through the day I have that existential crisis. I swear you're going to freak me out. Man, you did it, didn't you? You happy now? The second book that I want to talk about, I actually don't have it right here. Let me run you up to my office to show you where it is. So I'm pretty sure that I have the book right here in my office. Let me just look for it. No, it's not there. Though I forgot that I had that shirt. That's weird. I swear that I bought it when I got some food. Let me check and see. It might be over here instead. No, it must not have been that day. I swear. Oh, I know where it is. There we go. Imagine if when you bought things at the store and you brought them home, you organized them according to the day that you bought them. You bought marshmallows and a shirt and salad dressing and a book all on the same day, they go on this shelf. You buy books with your pancake mix, they're going in the pantry. You buy this book I wanna talk about the same day you happen to buy milk, it goes in the refrigerator. It doesn't make any sense. Your books are scattered all over the place. Your food is scattered over the place. There's absolutely no reason why you should organize your goods according to the day that you bought them. And there's a bigger principle here. This is from How to Take Smart Notes by Sonki Ahrens. I've only had it for a few weeks, but I feel like I've already internalized and appreciated so much of this book that I'm putting it on the book that has made me a better economist. Now, it's interesting, I don't have physical book copy of this book because I got it on the Kindle, but I do have notebooks right here. I store some of my notebooks. I hope I, I didn't think I knocked something over on Miles, sorry. So these are notebooks and I have a third notebook right here, right? I've just got a whole bunch of notebooks where I will keep these with me almost all the time and just write down little notes 
that come to my mind. Um, this channel started as a note in one of these notebooks. But the problem with these notebooks is that if you look, I organized them according to the date that I had that idea. Let's see, there's, there's a date. This is August 2019. Next day, if I know the date or the time when I had this insight, and then I can go to the book and I can find it. The problem is that's not how we work. A lot of the ideas that I've had over time have been lost to these books. They're, they're written, but I just don't know where to find these. They're not put in a place that I'm gonna find them. It's like buying marshmallows and salad dressing and a shirt all on the same day and putting them all in my office. That doesn't make sense. Just because I have ideas on the same day doesn't mean my notes should be organized by the same day. So instead, this book, How to Take Smart Notes, is about making sure you take notes in a way that you can find them in the future when you need them. And it gives a whole system called the slip box system. It has been great for me to go through. I just feel like I am learning so much more. In fact, I have a desire to go out there and learn more now that I'm using this note-taking system. To introduce how this third book made me a better economist, let me take you to Haiti in 2012. It's right after I've graduated from college. I'm on my way to go get a PhD and I'm going to be working in Haiti for the summer, helping out a microfinance organization. And I decided that I wanted to learn more about Haiti. So I grabbed a book on Haiti's history and I started reading it over that summer. And I came across this really interesting passage about how land in Haiti was given from generation to generation. I looked at that and thought, Wow, that cannot be good for the economy. It has to be something that's hurt their agriculture and the way that they've divided up their property rights. Well, my first year at Yale, I had an economic history professor and I talked to him and I said, hey, here's this thing that's interesting in Haiti. I don't know if this is something that I should research. A few months later, he came back to me and he said, you need to be looking at this. There are not enough economists looking at Haiti. And that ended up becoming my dissertation was that work on Haiti's land. So what does this have to do with this third book? Well, the third book is Range by David Epstein. It is a fantastic book about how people are able to connect ideas across disciplines and make huge breakthroughs. And it's not just ideas. He'll talk about athletes and how cross training in athletics is incredibly useful for developing your skills. But a lot of where he's developing these ideas is when you want a good idea in economics, you shouldn't just be studying economics. You should go out and study other related topics where people aren't looking there. And this is actually, to me, a principle that's just really borne out in a lot of the Nobel laureates. So this year, Paul Milgram and Bob Wilson won, and they don't even have PhDs in economics. Their PhDs were in operations research, which is a form of engineering. Last year, the Nobel laureates were Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duvlo, Michael Kramer. They were taking a lot of insights from the medical literature on how you test the efficacy of drugs by using randomized controlled trials. And they took those and applied them to policy to try and understand the effects of different policies. There have been tons of economists who have won the Nobel Prize for insights in behavioral economics, and those are insights combining economics with psychology. So many of the breakthroughs that we have in different fields come from combining different fields. Of course, I'm focused on economics, but this works in engineering. It works in science generally. The idea is when you get too siloed, you miss a lot of the insights that come when you expose yourself to other ideas. I never would have had the idea to research Haiti and its economic history had I not read a history book about Haiti. Range makes me a better economist by making me realize that the way that I can gain greater insights in economics is by making sure that I expose myself to ideas in other fields, by making sure that I'm not just focusing on economics books. That's actually why I don't read as many of these popular nonfiction books in economics anymore is because a lot of the ideas that I've been exposed to and rereading them doesn't do much for me. But I'll grab something like a biography or something about a business and I'll learn about those concepts and I can see where economics comes in there and it helps generate new ideas. Let's do another story to introduce the fourth and final book. My first semester at graduate school, my wife and I invited a lot of my classmates over to our house for Thanksgiving. And we were sitting around the table discussing life and food and alcohol came up. And I told my classmates, you know, these are people I've only known for basically a few weeks at that point, that I had never had alcohol. And a lot of them just kind of nodded and said like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. And then 
I followed that up with, I have never had coffee or tea either. And that's when they were just blown away, wondering how in the world somebody could do that. Now, the reason why I haven't had alcohol, coffee, or tea in my life is connected to this next book. This next book is Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a short, quick read. This one is great in that it gives you a really clear pattern on how you should be creating habits in your life. And the insight that stuck with me was that you can create better habits just by creating an identity that naturally leads to those habits. And that's what brings me to this coffee, tea, and alcohol one. I do not drink coffee, alcohol, or tea because I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in this religion, we do not believe that that is something we should be having. We believe that our bodies are temples. We should be taking care of our bodies. And as a result, we abstain from alcohol, coffee, tea, tobacco, any other sort of recreational drugs. We have an identity that says, don't have those things. So I don't even fall into this trap of starting to have these foods or drinks because it's just not part of my identity. Habits take quicker when they become part of your identity. So I make YouTube videos weekly and there are a lot of times where I say, I just don't know if I should make a video this week. But inside me, my identity says, you are a YouTuber. You make YouTube videos about economics. This is your identity. You will make the next video. Same with being an economist. I am an economist. I think about economics. I do economics research. It drives me forward to become a better economist by making sure my identity is consistent with the habits I'm creating. That's just one insight they gave for this. There's another insight on like keystone habits where you make sure that you use habits that you already use to create better habits that you want to have. And I do this in the morning since I've had this. I've been focusing on habits in the morning when I wake up. I have my routine and part of that routine is habits that make me a better economist. Like every morning, the first thing I do when I wake up is I pray and I read from scriptures. But then the next thing I do is I start working on a little bit of research. I'll write or I'll read research. I have a habit where every morning I get up and I do these things. And by creating that habit, I've been able to build more understanding and become a better economist. And now, okay, okay, look at this. This is where it all comes together. I have a habit where every morning I'm reading and as part of that reading, I'm taking better notes on where I can find this stuff in the future, where I want to come across this. So I'm creating a habit out of how to make smart notes by tying into this habit that I'd already created about reading and writing every morning. I'm becoming a better economist through my habits and it's helping me reinforce the lessons that I've learned from these other books. Since this is a community, I would love to know your insights on what has made you a better economist this year. Let me know in the comments below and hopefully you and I and everybody else who is watching this video can be edified through each other's comments. And if you're looking for ideas, I have created some other videos on how to be a better economist and a better economics student. So if you haven't seen those yet, which most of you probably have since I, you know this is a community already, go ahead and check those out and we will see you next time on Market Power.